Good afternoon, uh, Professor Prabhat Patnaik. We are meeting today, 24th of May 2019, a day after the stunning election results, which have kind of have a second saffron wave uh, sweeping this country. 13 states, 50% vote. What does this mean for the future of Indian politics and uh, progressive forces in the country? You know, what I feel is that a vote like this cannot be explained in terms of ordinary uh, factors or, you know, in terms of the usual discourse. I think this is symptomatic of the fact that people need someone who would provide the figure of a strong man, leader, messiah, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's not what Modi has done. It is not a vote for Modi, the concrete person. It's a vote for a person whose need the people feel at this juncture and who they feel is and Modi approximates best. So, so in that sense, suppose, you know, there's an interesting story I read somewhere that somebody was told five years ago in 2014 that actually a mill is going to be open, the Chokidar of the mill, sugar mill. And that sugar mill has not been open for five years. That person still voted Modi, even though Modi had reneged on his promise, because agar koi kar sakta hai, to Modi ji hi kar sakte hai. So, so everybody is really looking at him in that sense. So, so it's not a vote for a man who is there. It's a vote for a man that never was. And, and, you know, in that sense, I think these are important factors. One has to go into the mass psychology of, of fascism, that how people need at certain points, you know, these big messianic figures and then invest some concrete individual with those kinds of qualities. Psychology of mass fascism, you said, and you wrote that work Shadows of Fascism earlier. Uh, so I'll come to that, I was going to come to it later, where you actually say that Hitler had managed to uh, assuage the jobless uh, youth of Germany by uh, getting jobs or giving some kind of jobs and employment. That's not been the case in India. In fact, exactly. we've seen a spiral of unemployment. So is it something else? Is it a different form of fascism? What is it? Well, you know, contemporary fascism will have to be very different from what it was earlier. Because I think this fascism is quite incapable of providing any answers to the economic problems. As a matter of fact, the more people talk about economic problems and so on, the less would be the appeal of Modi and his crowd. As a matter of fact, one of the advantages he has had in this election is that he steered it clear of any discussion of unemployment, of, of, of poverty and things of that kind, of the agrarian distress and things of that kind, all the material problems of people's lives. As a result, this fascism is quite different. The earlier fascism also addressed at least up to a point the material conditions of people's lives, which was at that time afflicted by unemployment. So there is a big difference between that fascism fascism and now. What then is the, I mean, we met at a press conference soon after 2014 where Ifan Habib Sahib was there, you were there, at, it was at the press club. And I remember you saying, which is a line we all took after that, that we have proto-fascists in power today. We have an ideology that governs, which does not believe in the constitution. And therefore you called it proto-fascist. Uh, we thought that was a wave. Now this appears the real wave that appears a kind of a winner election. Uh, what then are the markers that we see of this brand of fascism? Because one of the things I've been reading and maybe resisting, as many of us did, is young and very, very good journalists who've gone into the heartlands, who've been actually reporting back, saying a couple of things. They've said these are not quote unquote mainstream uh, journalists. They've written about the fact that in the far reaches of Jharkhand, and Chhattisgarh, they found a very deep-rooted anti-Muslim hatred, which has penetrated. So what we are looking at is like technology. Uh, so actually, we are looking at layers of an argument, which is being peddled on the other side. And then, of course, Modi for another five years sort of sums it all up. Uh, and there's a the use of technology, there's a the use of communication, there's the use of uh, organization. Because apart from the traditional RSS and its 
mammoth machine. Post 2014, Amit Shah invited Indians to become members of the BJP. And six or seven crore people enrolled. And all of them have sort of been connected up to the ballot box and the, and the booth. So how does one look at all of this before we talk of resisting? You know, this is not simply RSS. In other words, I think it would be a complete mistake to think of it as RSS. Uh, of course, RSS is there. I mean, it's, 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 it's a basic infrastructure on which everything is built. But this is something very different. There is a difference between 2019 and 2014. In 2014, at least, Modi engaged on a discourse in which everybody else was also engaged. Okay, you know, I mean, you talked about problems, you know, material material problems of life and so on. This time he has completely avoided all that. And nonetheless, he has got this thumping majority. And this is because of, as I said, that, you know, I mean, people are looking for somebody uh, and, and, and they invest him with those qualities they are looking for, even though he doesn't have them. Okay. Now, I think this is a very different situation. Now, I think in this situation, uh, well, I think proto-fascism is something I was using that time. I would say that this is as close to fascism as you can get. Of course, in contemporary conditions, it's not a fascist state we are going to have. Uh, it will be... It will be as close to a fascist state, but on the other hand, you are not going to have concentration camps and such like things. But uh, but you would probably continue to have elections, but the election commission would be their man who would do all kinds of skullduggery. Similarly, you are going to have all the trappings of a democratic order, but the essence of the order would be missing because of the fact that the Supreme Court would be there, the, all the institutions they would capture and use for their own purposes. It may not be nominally Hindu Rashtra, but on the other hand, insofar as you have the NRC and so on, effectively there would be two kinds of citizens. So, so we are going to have fascism in that sense in contemporary times without actually having a replica of the 1930s, which in, in any case is not possible today and also would arouse a lot of international comment and opposition and so on. So, so I think this is, this is really the kind of, you know, road to fascism that we are seeing in our country. Now, I think this is also going to then imply that it's going to become far more authoritarian, far more uh, repressive, uh, far more intolerant, because uh, the other thing also I want to say is that there is a looming economic crisis. And when that economic crisis hits, uh, hits the, the, the country, the intolerance would be greatly increased. How does one resist? Today we already are getting news of parts of around Calcutta having riots, which are the working class areas, uh, areas where the BJP has swept to power. Bengal has got a huge number of seats in the vote. How does, how do the people resist? How do citizens resist? And how does the left rebuild itself? Yes, I mean, I think the basic thing is to change people's discourse from the kind of things that they see in Modi to bread and butter problems of life, to material conditions of life. I think the more that discourse we move towards, the better it is as far as any progressive cause is concerned. I think the Congress came up with the Naya scheme, whatever you may think of it, but the point is they did not push it sufficiently. They should have gone hammer and tongs at it instead of getting caught up in saying Modi Chor hai and so on and so forth, which in any case did not cut much ice with the people. So. I think is very important for the left to actually, uh, you know, emphasize the discourse of deprivation which people are facing. And as I said, the economic crisis is looming. And I think the left also must get its priorities right in terms of what is the main enemy and who is the main enemy. I think in Bengal, this 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 uh, equidistance between TMC as well as Modi is something that really did not work out because effectively it meant that willy-nilly a part of your own vote bank actually went over to the BJP. I think they should actually have made it very clear that they are against Modi, they are more against Modi than Mamta is, and if Mamta is against Modi, then she must create conditions for the left to be able to function. They should have demanded that. 
Uh, that's a very interesting point you make because it's not just Bengal, we're also looking at Kerala. And there's this whole question about whatever Congress has lost everywhere else, it has picked up in Kerala at the cost of the left. So there is also that inherent uh, conflict and contradiction among the non-authoritarian uh, parties, the non-RSS parties. And uh, with the shrinking space in parliament, the misunderstandings can grow. So how do they cope and how do they cope politically and of course structurally? No, you know, I, I don't think because we haven't got enough seats that the left's uh, influence in the country has gone down proportionately. Not at all. I mean, obviously, they are still powerful trade unions, Kisan movements and so on, which they must build upon. Uh, but on the other hand, obviously, parliament counts. I mean, the number of seats you have in parliament counts, whether they are counted as a national party or not, on which I suppose there would be lots of discussions now. Uh, that counts. Uh, so, but I think even within that, I think the left did a very good thing in Kerala even though it has lost seats by doing the Sabari Mela verdict. Okay. In other words, I think the left's role is not just to win seats in parliament, it's to carry forward the social revolution in the country. And to that extent, it did a very good role, even though it may have lost seats because of that. Between the left and the Congress, I suppose the main difference was this. I think the Congress actually played an opportunistic role on Shabri Mala. But on the other hand, uh, I, I would not think that the left has actually lost in any way because of that. In terms of in terms of appealing to the intelligentsia, appealing to the sensitive people, appealing to those who live a life of the mind and so on. Because after all, the left's appeal has to be that. Fundamentally, the left has to be a thinking entity. And as a result, it cannot just do all kinds of opportunistic things. So from that point of view, it's fine. I'm not unduly depressed about it. I think in Bengal, there was a very serious mistake, miscalculation. They should have focused on taking on the BJP as the main enemy. Buddha Bhattacharji made a statement about that towards the end, but then that was too late. You know, by, by, by that time, people had made up their minds. But I think that's the position they should have taken right from the beginning. But I think for the left, this fight against fascism is not just a fight for more seats. This fight against fascism is actually to mobilize all the forces in a proactive way in order to really put up a resistance. The, uh, will there be greater physical threat and insecurity of the quote-unquote enemies of the emerging Hindu Rashtra? I mean, there have been so many attacks in the last few years. I'm not talking about just the rationalists, but about ordinary Muslims being lynched. Now we are seeing riots. So uh, um, apart from the economic crisis and stuff we'll see, I think the physical insecurity that sections of people will, uh, will, will experience would be quite frightening. How do we all cope with that? Yes, you know, in fact, I think the... There are two looming dangers. One, of course, as I mentioned, the economic crisis. The other is the danger that this kind of movement towards Hindu Rashtra might actually provoke ISIS and other Muslim organizations to come into the country and really to to further polarize communally the entire population. That would be disastrous. That, When that happens, India would have joined the ranks of the failed states. Till now, we had avoided it. But on the other hand, the BJP is taking us in that direction. Already you find in Kashmir, uh, there is a lot of opposition to, 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 to India now. Uh, and I think that's going to grow all over. Because if everybody cannot relate to this country, then of course they are going to now take the law into their own hands and look after themselves in any way that they like. Now, I think for the left, both these are very serious challenges. The problem with the looming economic crisis is that by the time the economic crisis hits us, the BJP would have left the economy in such a state where the degree of freedom for doing anything else would be less. You know, in other words, it becomes that much more difficult to do anything from that situation. And secondly, as far as this is concerned, the moment you actually have some kind of communal fascism of the of, of the of the Muslim variety, which also begins to grow, once you get caught in this kind of intra-fascist kind of conflicts becomes very difficult for the left to intervene. As you find in lots of Middle Eastern countries, where the left used to be very powerful, but now is really reduced to a shadow of itself. So I think they just have to uh, move right from now. 
I think before the Muslim masses get disillusioned and large numbers of the youth. Because today the attacks are happening against the Muslims. Exactly, right? exactly. And lots of their youths are now going to be drawn towards self-defense of some kind, which means arming themselves as Muslims. I think it's very important for the left to intervene there itself and to uh, I I intervene, of course, for peace, but additionally also intervene for raising issues of, of people's livelihood. I think the more we do that, the more we would be able to mobilize everybody together. Finally, um, uh, Mr. Patnayak, the left, organized left, very, very rightly boasts of mass organizations, the unions, the fronts, the ADWA, etc. Totally, in, I think, a membership of Accor and above is what we are told. And that's a very significant number. Should we also not be asking the question that where this one crore votes? What is its social consciousness apart from the fact that it's a member of this uh, last large mass organization? Because we've seen in the past a certain dichotomy sometimes emerge when we don't have a strong enough ideological fight. I completely agree. In fact, a lot of the people who would be members of the mass organizations would not only not vote left, they might even vote for the BJP. They might even vote for communal parties and so on. So I think from that point of view also, it's very important to step up ideological work against the BJP. I think one of the past failures of the left in, in more recent times has been this, namely that, you know, our own front organizations do not vote left. Uh, that's partly because sometimes we make tactical mistakes and so on, and they themselves rectify implicitly this tactical mistake. But if we make such mistakes, then we must not have a situation where they rectify it by voting BJP. So, so the thing is that, you know, that we have to strengthen our ideological preparations against this BJP in a very big way. I, in, in other words, I think even though we may have lost the elections, I think now we have to join the war. You know, there's a big war against the BJP and we have to join it. History, the role of history, historical symbols, the national movement, all of this is what we marched with. But the younger generation seems to be disconnected. But you know, I'd just like to say one thing, that, that phenomena like the emergence of fascism are not confined to India. In fact, it's an international phenomenon. There is a movement towards the right all over the world. In some places, the left has... Uh, you know, stemmed it or prevented it, very few places, Mexico being the latest example, but where it has done so, it has done so by, shall we say, using novel methods, using new, yeah, you know, it's it's not the traditional Mexican Communist Party, it's not the traditional, shall we say, you know, kind of Venezuelan or Bolivarian. So, so would you talk about that? What are these unconventional methods? Yeah, so I think we have to, for a start, of course, now the social media and so on are very important. I don't think the left should ever give up Marxism. I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely opposed to all that because Marxism is what provides us with a solid theoretical understanding. But I think organizationally and so on, a lot of the young people are not drawn to the left. My son, for instance, is a Marxist. My son, I mean, he, 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 he does philosophy. So, so he's drawn to the philosophy of Marxism. He's drawn to the left perspective and vision. But on the other hand, he's not drawn to the traditional communist parties. Now, I think that is something which has to be overcome. And how we do so uh, is something which would be a real challenge. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Patna. I you. hope that your words will inspire many of us who are feeling quite lost after Thank yesterday. You.